it's an easy for me to start with the scientific text after so warm and uh, uh, touching words. Uh, I want first, uh, of course, to thank uh, the Freud Museum organization, its uh, directors, uh, Monica Pessler, uh, and uh, the scientific director, uh, Daniela Finzi, and Gohar, uh, whom uh, I know for years and I value so much, and who is the first Iranian IPA member and recognized psychoanalyst there. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, I hope my English is uh, clear enough to be understood, and uh, I will speak about this theme, which is, uh, in my view, a psychoanalytic theme. Uh, uh, I will tell you. <laughs> when, when I started writing about this concept in the early 80s, the word empathy circulated almost exclusively in the United States, even if Sigmund Freud had mentioned it several times in his works, as you know. The North American authors, like Schaefer, Kohut, Greenson at that time, and others, from the 60s had given room and relevance to a clinical phenomenon, empathy, that seemed to be of scarce interest at the time for the Europeans, who were so concentrated on metapsychological issues or on the internal world of intra-psychic vicissitudes to be interpreted, uh, they didn't care so much. Uh, they didn't think this world could be something psychoanalytic. Instead, their North American colleagues paid special attention to the resonance and sensitivity of the analyst when impacting the patient's experience as a factor of huge importance in the psychoanalytic process. Besides other more complex psychoanalytic views, generally the word empathy in Europe evoked some superficial mix of sweet tenderness, benevolence a priori, friendly support, and no interpretive penetration for disclosing the unconscious level of the psychic reality. Uh, it was a bit like a, a pat pat on the shoulder in the mentality of the time. Uh, consequently, this term had been treated with some disdain by professionals. Also, the historical controversy between Otto Kernberg and Heinz Kohut at the beginning of the 70s raised little interest and had been at least partially misunderstood in Europe. In my opinion, as a dispute between the strong position of openly presenting to the patient the destructive part of his personality, on one hand, or the weak position of leaving the patient a long maturational self all the time with no interpretive interventions by the analyst, what I would call a crisis-like crisis solution in the first case versus a lysis-like solution in the second. Intervening and interpreting or waiting and uh, leaving the process go ahead by itself. This reductive version of two much richer theoretical and clinical backstages, represented at the time by Kernberg inheriting the post kleinian culture, and by Kohut, more connected with the Ferenczi Balin tradition, reflected some unjustified superiority complex by many European analysts towards the complex adventure of studying the analytical relationship in itself. For many of them, the scientific truth of psychoanalysis should follow more pragmatic paths by reasoning mostly in terms of drives, defenses, and ego working through, uh, 
and sometimes assuming that contact, intuition, co-experience, sharing, etc., could be more of an obstacle than a real factor in analysis. I understand this historical data may be not so stimulating for a non-specialistic audience. Maybe today here there is a mixed audience, partially professionals, partially intellectuals interested in the matter. Uh, but I wanted to start with this, to clarify how for a long time analysts both conflicted about empathy and also disconfirmed its belonging to the psychoanalytic conceptual area and its relevance in analytic treatment. On the other hand, the picture I will draw about empathy will probably surprise and also disappoint some expectations. I will disappoint all those who expect that an analyst, after having been trained, can voluntarily decide to be empathic, and that an empathic approach can be planned in advance. My opinion is that one can decide to give room to the words of the other, to listen to him, and to bear with patience his sometimes painful or boring mood, etc. But usually, when an analyst plans to be empathic, believe me, the premise for a failure, or at least for misunderstandings, is there. I will be empathic, you go wrong, for sure. This led me to some disagreement on this specific point with authors like Kohut himself and Model, whom I value very much. Unlike them, I don't think empathy can be a method. It's not a method. I think empathy is a kind of experience we can only facilitate through training and thanks to long-term psychic cohabitation with our patients. But in the session, it remains an unpredictable event. I will disappoint those who assume that the discovery of the mirroring neurons even if hugely important and really fascinating, can explain empathy at a complex level in human interactions. More extensively, I will disappoint those who believe empathy is something simple. Parma, the town of the great scientific team, Rizzolatti, Gallese, and others, that discovered the mirroring neurons one of the most quoted recent discoveries in the scientific field, maybe a, a, a Nobel Award will be given to this group in the future, is only 60 kilometers from Bologna, my town. And it is a privilege for me and for my Bolognese colleagues to have the opportunity, as I myself have had many times, to discuss with them their scientific achievements, which are really innovative, also for the connection between neurosciences and psychoanalysis. However, their wonderful discoveries still cannot explain the complexity of real human understanding, while it can impressively clarify the process of many less profound interactions, at least up to now. Nevertheless, the concept of embodied simulation formulated by Gallese, one of the main team workers there, opens a new perspective on the capacity of the parietal mirroring neurons to resonate regarding not only the bodily movements, but also the intentions and mental plans of the subject we are facing. Anyway, the clinical example I will present can show how the multi-level interchange that can lead to an empathic situation in treatment is much more complex. And here I must clarify that my speciality is to show the difference between normal empathy and psychoanalytic empathy, which is something more specific and highly different. 
And again, mostly I will disappoint those who believe that being technically empathic automatically implies something good, benign and benevolent. Unfortunately, there are some occurrences in life where a perverse or criminal skill includes empathy regarding the psychic condition of the potential victim, a competence that can allow the aggressor to better circumvent or to condition the other, while perceiving exactly how the other is interiorly organized, how he feels and how he works. Everyone knows how many perfectly trained mafiosi are able to exert a deep influence on the mental attitude of another person by threatening him in a subtle, underlying, unapparent way that bypasses the other's conscious level so that the victim feels some malaise but initially doesn't recognize so well the source of that feeling, since the mafioso had been so kind and friendly when he had taken him by the arm. So a very nice person. But the underlying message goes uh, downstairs and uh, invades the victim. This would be impossible if the mafioso, like other criminals, doesn't uh, envisage and perceive and represents well in his mind the mental organization and the state of the other. A special empathy is needed for such a skilled capacity. This threatening technique could not be put to work without a sophisticated, precise and complex perception at multiple levels of the other's mental state and of his internal defensive organization. To empathize with the defensive ego of the victim is fundamental for an expert delinquent. And this implies a partial identification with that part of him in order to condition him in a more effective way. So no benevolence, no good feelings. This is something different. Another universal source of complexity is that human beings are necessarily conflictual. So in analysis, we need to contact at least two conflictual parts of le or levels of them. Furthermore, all human beings are at least partially split this is a universal reality. Consequently, we have to get in touch not only with their central conscious ego, but also with the parts or fragments of them that are split and projected outside, and frequently just inside the analyst. Sooner or later, during the treatment, we will impact these split parts since they work for being re-included into the self or in the analytical field. Sooner or later, we are sure to have the opportunity to resonate, see, hear, and smell these parts. Finally, to recognize these pieces of the puzzle and reconstruct the potential unity of the person. Unfortunately, very rarely we will be in command with our technique while walking towards this final goal. For this reason, many authors described the main role of surprise in their clinical experiences, particularly when the most important passages of the process happened in spite of the analyst having different expectations. So empathy is for me in many cases an event, more than a goal and more than a method. I think sharing, sharing is a necessary step for experiencing at the level of the self what the patient experiences. This allows the analyst working with the self, not only working with the ego. Nevertheless, this is not enough for me, at least when we are speaking of psychoanalytic empathy. Also, the working ego of both analyst and patient should be enabled to participate in the process. 
in order to complete the job through representation, through formulation, through final awareness. Anyway, the experiential working self and the recognizing working ego of the patient have to be integrated in order to avoid the risk of confusing identification on the one hand and the risk of cognitive intellectualization on the other. Finally, by summarizing all these requirements, like many other authors who studied this topic, I gave my personal definition of empathy, which I repropose here. True empathy is a condition of conscious and pre-conscious contact characterized by separateness, complexity, and a linked structure, a wide perceptual spectrum, including every color in the emotional palette, from the lightest to the darkest. Above all, it constitutes a progressive shared and deep contact with the complementarity of the object, with the other's defensive ego and split of parts, no less than with his egosyntonic subjectivity. To put at work, to put to work this complex criteria, which is more appropriate for psychoanalytic empathy than for the usual kind of human empathy, I will shortly propose three examples. I will present First, a classical clinical scene where repression is the main defensive factor and the analyst experiences an internal two-level organization of the patient, one level being conscious and the other one unconscious. This is something classical in psychoanalysis. Second, a more complex situation in which multiple identifications are involved and an analyst and his supervisor explore such complexity in a progressive working through, allowing them to put themselves in the many shoes of the patient. Third and finally, a clinical session that pushed the analyst in a forcefully shared experience and then to a mutual recognition of both the patient's feeling of detachment from his own self and the repeated interpersonal tragedy of his habitual impossibility to be understood. The first case, the classical one, is about Grazia. Grazia was a patient. Doctor. I love him with all my heart, declared Grazia during a psychotherapy session, theatrically placing her hands on her breast and leaning forward. She was giving to me her interiors. All the while gazing at me sorrowfully. She was desperate as if the better to convince me. She was referring to her husband, defined as irrationally jealous, whom she swore to adore without any reserve whatsoever. She pronounced that phrase with an expression of desperation on her face. Doctor, I love him with all my heart. Her eyes staring into space and moving her head from left to right disconsolately. I love him, I love him. <laughs> With the paradoxical effect of unconsciously giving the lie to her own words. It was not true. <laughs> I love him. This scene came to my mind when, two months later, Grazia suddenly betrayed her husband, swept off her feet by having truly fallen in love for the first time in her life with another man. I reflected that in that dramatically tense session, two different Grazias had expressed themselves, one conscious and intentional, 
reactively grieved and conformist. And they are the unconscious, who from inside was sending out a contrary signal, like a prisoner who has come up with a trick to get a message out from prison through the jailer. This was the strange paradox. While the first Grazia declared her love for her husband, the second Grazia, unknown to the first, shook her head, meaning don't believe her. That's not the way things are. <laughs> As one can understand, Assuming her exterior theatrical behavior as authentic wouldn't have been empathic. A deeper empathy implied at least the perception of the two main levels. Much work had to be done for better understanding the long story of her conflict and of her partial impossibility to be egosyntonically authentic. So this is a a very simple fragment of a classical repression and double reality. More complex, the second clinical example. Looking at the scene from the window. Psychoanalysts, unlike ordinary people, are trained to keep their minds open to complexity always to leave a part of their mental screen unsaturated, to be able to make room in a representative way for new developments in a situation and other points of view. Here is a small example of what I mean. A candidate presented to me a session with an agoraphobic patient with whom he had worked for many months in analysis. He was trying to extricate her from a complicated tangle consisting of the combination of the difficulties relating to the patient's internal integration, on the one hand, and the patient's own reluctance to abandon some of the secondary advantages of the illness, on the other. Basically, it was a question of losing sight neither of the patient's genuine insecurity and the idea of leaving home alone, she perceived their own effective pseudo-maturity towards separating, establishing her own identity and being her own person, nor of a retinue of fixed pleasures which she had little intention of giving up connected to being able, having to be accompanied everywhere by her husband, who was like a brother to her, or by her father, who was, to some extent, in her mind, like a husband to her. The patient's father, an authoritarian type with a strong personality, emerged as symbiotic and hypercritical at the same time. Both aspects were there. He was absolutely controlling in a symbiotic way, but he was also acting as a superego. And this made her hypersensitive in the transference to every communication by the psychoanalyst. My young colleague, the candidate, managed to focus rather well on the concomitant presence of these factors and therefore the complexity of the problem. During supervision, we had many opportunities to reflect, partly by means of the patient's direct responses or associations <laughs> prompted by his interventions, on whether the latter were on the target and usable or the contrary. For example, the psychoanalyst had occasion to point out to the patient the way she hung on to fusional pleasures associated with expectations of maintaining control over the object, which she recognized as having been developed and encouraged although they were not indispensable, and which she gave him support for. <laughs> 
At other times, on the other hand, the patient had seen him as being unfairly distrustful towards her and had shown him, in one way or another, that he had not really taken note of her very real deep incapacity. My colleague reported an interesting event which took place after a week of sessions during which there had been clashes between analyst and patient, more or less about this dilemma. How much is the real difficulty? And how much is the pleasure of having control? The patient was out on the balcony of her house, together with her husband, intent on watching the people passing by on the street below. The two were there looking downstairs and uh, passing their time calmly. On the other side of the road, a mother went into a greengrocer's, leaving her four-year-old girl to play outside the shop. The patient recognized the woman. She knew that she lived nearby, nearby also had a little boy, that there was a lot of tension in the home and that she, the woman, was going, she was on the verge of getting separated. So some pain in that family. Suddenly, the little girl knelt down on the ground and deliberately waved the knees of her thighs to make them dirty. Then she limped in to see her mother. The patient and her husband watched this scene from the balcony and were moved by it. They had understood that the little girl had herself, by herself, created this little accident and wanted to show to her mother this problem and this pain. The patient's father, who had silently joined them from behind in the meantime, and had also witnessed the scene, commented with a sarcastic sneer, well, what a cunning little thing she is. She is clever. So he proposed once again a, a cynical view on the motivation of the little girl. While the two, the patient and the husband, had been touched painfully. The patient told the psychoanalyst that at the time she felt intense sorrow and sadness when the father had commented this way. Come back to the candidate. Commenting on this scene, my colleague observed that it was highly significant on, on several levels. The patient was seen to be capable of considerable empathic identification with the child. She understood that both, both the child's simulation and her sufferings were real, but most of all that in this case the simulation what was a consequence of the suffering. The little girl felt that her internal suffering did not reach the other's attention and ingenuously attempted to propose to the mother another type of suffering that was more concrete and less avoidable. The patient, but also her husband, showed they were capable of putting themselves in the child's place and reconstructing it in terms of somewhat complex inner logic. Moreover, they shared the emotion and thoughts connected to this episode. We might say that though they are not experts in this field, they showed extraordinary psychological sensitivity. Of course, the analytical work carried out so far made the patient more perceptive and observant of mental life. 
My colleague, however, quite appropriately, went beyond the patient's point of view, which he greatly appreciated, however, and added to it with an interpretation. Through her account, she had brought the analyst's attention to her own genuine deep suffering, which he had underestimated over the preceding days in the session when he had said, ah, but you are to link to the fusional pleasure. You are not so much in difficulty. More or less, he had behaved like the father of the patient in this case. The patient was rather surprised after this communication by the analyst, this connection with the previous session, and replied that it was true. Here the session ended with an encouraging feeling that something had been stated, had reached this addressee, and that they had managed to understand each other the analyst and the patient. I asked my colleague what he thought of the father's remark, a restrictive and distrustful comment on the simulation request for help by the little girl. I also pointed out to him that the father had made this comment from behind, coming up on them unexpectedly. From behind means that there is a similarity with the position of the analyst with the patient, of course. The candidate thought that the father represented him, the analyst, as well as the real father, and the negative paternal fantasy, hypercritically, hypercritical and heavily incumbent, had been rendered almost tangible the previous week in his somewhat excessive insistence on analyzing her expectations for control, without enough attention and therapeutic effort being given to both facets of the patient's inner world, the needs versus the regressive and fixed desires. In any case, this sequence supplied him with some useful indications. I told him, the candidate, that in my opinion, even the patients sharing this comprehension and emotion with their husband was a continuation of the work he and the patient were carrying out. We thus continued our work of reflection, pursuing a chain of development through various windows, the green grocer's shop window, the patient's balcony, my colleague's studio, and the supervision could in turn generate new ideas. I will not go further into the analysis of this material. I merely want to draw the readers or the uh, listeners' attention to the comparison of two different capacities for contact and articulate thought, that of the patient and that of my young colleague. I chose this scene because I see in it the modus operandi of two people with the gift of sensitivity and the ability to identify themselves with others, at least on this specific occasion. You will certainly have noticed the open-mindedness, open specifically to complexity, of, this, of the psychoanalyst. It is this open-minded attitude derived from, derived from training and method that facilitates access to the articulation, further development, and multi-layered interpretation of the scenes presented in sessions. This is a very special feature, feature which belongs to us as psychoanalysts and which, despite our many faults, characterize those who share our training. Final clinical scene, Mr. Piero's leave taking. Mr. Piero had been in analysis with me for a number of years. At the beginning of treatment, everything about him seemed to provoke feelings of hostility. Even if rich and successful himself, he was scornful and sadistically hypercritical 
toward the rest of the mankind, not hesitating to exploit our other's weaknesses to his own advantage. Toward analysis, his attitude was one of mockery, and with a caustic blend of sarcasm, mistrust, pedantry, and neglect, he had in effect prevented me from working on his analysis for a couple of years. A terrible patient. <laughs> the few things I had been allowed to say were regularly chewed up and spat out, as if they were worthless. Yet, in another sense, he had forced me to work, causing me to experience at first hand and for a considerable time the unhappiness of his libidinal self projected into the other, in that case into me, and there attacked, vilified, and suffocated. A bad experience. If he felt like I felt, I can say he was a serious and suffering patient. <coughs> he had sought treatment when he realized that through his way of being was of great advantage in his work, it made it impossible for him to have warm human relationships in general, but this was of little concern for him to him. And in particular, this was the point, it made him cold and irritable towards his children, whom he experienced as strangers. These initial glimmerings of awareness had been traumatic. It was almost a reenactment of the myth of King Midas. All it touched came to his advantage. But this made him so cruel, also with his children, that, that when he realized this at the first time, he had his first doubt about his way of being. He had told me this with a certain apparent nonchalance, while allowing me to a glimpse into his desperation, enough to convince me to accept him as my patient. The session I shall report came at the end of several years of hard work. Mr. Piero had, uh, by this time, changed considerably. Whilst retaining many of his characteristics, he had uh, reconstructed many of his more human attributes and gradually allowed himself more confidence, sincerity, and familiarity in analysis, which brought him similar changes and benefits at home with his family. Analytically speaking, I would say that we had become quite good friends. I had also learned a great deal from him, since he knew much more about certain things than I did. In short, I had just begun to like him when he proposed we should agree to terminate analysis the following summer at which, apart from the satisfaction of a good job well done, I also felt a pang of displeasure. However, in the session in question, we seemed to have returned to our initial climate, notice after he had said, I will terminate, but he regressed. Mr. Piero was extremely vexed by a contractual disagreement with a firm whose company name had something to do with Bologna. I am Bolognini, as you know. One of the two contracting parties, the firm Bologna himself, had to lose out, and it was a matter of deciding which my patient was absolutely convinced that he was right and was particularly annoyed with his wife who had suggested a way out and uh, uh, which would solve the problem to neither party's detriment. 
the, the wife had uh, f easily found a solution that could uh, avoid the damage for both of them. But there was something more here, and uh, he didn't want to lose anything in case of contract and separation, of course. She, the wife, had not understood his anger and his sense of narcissistic defeat. At the time, I did not grasp the unconscious reference to the two different levels of our relationship. Anxiety for the psychoanalytic separation by which someone would inevitably lose out the action against the Bologna company. And my presence as a deaf and rather uncompre uncomprehending consultant corresponding to his wife's advice, lacking as it was logic, but not psychological. My mind dulled over for a good half hour, as the page is also interesting that I didn't understand nothing. So there was a mutual barrier, not only the patient didn't, didn't realize he was speaking also about the two of us. Me too. And I began to find him annoying, spiteful, nasty, and even disappointing. Then he paused and changed the subject. He began to tell me how, for business reasons, the previous evening he had dined alone in a half-empty restaurant in another city. A German couple were dining at another table some distance from him. From him. Uh, the, only these two tables were occupied, my patient and the German couple. So there was a very empty restaurant. He could only see the girl's back and the strange thing was that one of her feet was out of its shoe. Mr. Piero was a little bothered by this. The girl then began to move her toys around, and Mr. Piero, who was sipping his soup, became seriously indignant. He was about to call the waiter for complaining. <laughs> As he was telling me the story, I could just imagine the scene, and I felt like laughing, <laughs> knowing how demanding and fussy he was. I found it all irresistibly amusing, and to an extent, I was getting my revenge for the previous half hour of analytic <laughs> tedium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I made absolutely sure that not a whimper was to be heard. I was silent. I was still. Then Mr. Piero stopped, stopped talking a moment, turned to me with great, great seriousness, and said, At this point, the woman picked up the glass with her foot and lift it to her lips. In doing so, she had to turn slightly towards me. She had no arms. There was a dead silence for a minute or so. I felt terribly and deeply ashamed of having loved up my sleeve. Then he said, I know you were laughing up your sleeve just now. But then you were left thunderstruck, just like me. I think we understand each other, you and me. You see, doctor, how easy it is to misjudge an apparently offensive gesture if you don't know the situation properly. I was left speechless, but not just speechless. I was astounded, dumbfounded, and utterly thunderstruck. Then my mind cleared. 
I realized that he was not just talking about the poor handicapped girl, but also about himself. He it was who had had sorry, who had had no arms to embrace his loved ones, to shake my hand, to touch and feel things properly. And he it was who had not been seen as he really was for such a long time. Indeed, that very day I must have been defending myself, just as he was, against the displeasure of our forthcoming separation, and had not seen his difficulty in terminating analysis. I had judged him rather harshly, just as once his parents had done, so blind and deaf to him, and symbolically without arms to embrace him. And he too had been hard on himself, misreading, scorning and sneering at his own humanity. But those years of analysis had not been in vain. Mr. Piero had not attempted to simply evacuate his trauma totally onto me. He had carefully sought and brought about the sharing of those dumbfounding elements with me when he led me to jump in my seat as the girl turned around. I was very ashamed of myself, as I said before, but nevertheless experienced a strong sense of deep empathy with the patient for whom I felt great esteem, genuine respect and a sense of brotherliness. And my thoughts turned to our profession, so strange and unpredictable that we can hardly ever decide what is ours to experience next. Thank you. Thank you.